raised about, uh, what, $800 or so, maybe a little more than that for um, uh, Boys and Girls Club. That was a great thing to uh, kiss pig. So thank you for the Caldwells to kiss a pig. That was great. Hey, if you weren't uh, here for Vacation Bible School, then you will uh, need to know that what they really talked about was worship around the world and that worship in different places in our world is not like the way that we get to do it here. And that there's often persecution and ways that people have to really struggle in order to be able to have the ability to get together and proclaim Jesus. And so it was one of those things. It was an awareness thing. It was wonderful because our team wrote all that curriculum themselves and developed the entire thing. It was a beautiful thing, and I'm so proud of that. And uh, hopefully you got to be a part of it. If not, we had about 100 kids there, and hopefully next year we'll uh, double that number and we'll continue to plant seeds of faith and hope in these kids that will last a lifetime. And so, speaking of children, uh, once upon a time, there was a um, very bad summer thunderstorm, and a mom was going to, uh, che- to check on the kid and tuck him in at night, and as she's tucking him in and off to uh, turn off the light, you know, for the last time... Uh, for the evening, the little boy in his shaky voice says, Mommy, would you please sleep with me tonight? And she smiled and she said, I'm sorry, honey, I need to sleep with your daddy tonight. I'm not going to be able to do that for you. And a little bit of silence. And then the shaky voice declared, the big sissy. (laughs) It took a minute. That's okay. The question is, what terrorizes you? What is it that keeps you up at night, that makes the uh, acid churn in your stomach and the heart beat funny? What comes after you in fear? Maybe it's personal stuff. Maybe it's stuff like debt or that there's just too much month left over at the end of the paycheck. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's work or school or something else. Maybe the stuff that keeps you up at night and terrorizes you is anger or hatred or grudges or lack of forgiveness for somebody else who's harmed you. You've heard me say it before, and no doubt you have heard this, that the lack of forgiveness for to other people or for other people that have harmed you, it's like drinking poison and waiting for them to die. But it doesn't work that way. It just eats us from the inside out and slowly kills us. Maybe the things that terrorize you, though, aren't just personal things, although I would guess that every one of us have our own things that we're afraid of that mess with us on a daily basis. But when we look at things in a more global scale, I think we would probably all agree that there are all kinds of challenges out there that could very well make us afraid, that could bring great and tremendous fear or even terror in some cases. Often these days we hear people talking a lot about our freedoms being constantly taken away. And of course, it's Independence Day weekend. We celebrate that tomorrow. It's not just about fireworks though, is it? It is the fact that freedom is not free. And thank God we've had so many that have fought for us to allow us to have the freedom to do what we are doing right now. That we can declare the name of Jesus openly with very little concern for harm. But still, the idea of our freedoms being taken away causes so much terror and frustration and fear for so many. And there's other things. How about the global economy? Or just the fact that the world just seems like it's on fire and the world is at war. Or maybe the elections in November keep you up at night. Or maybe it's just terrorists. After all, that's what terrorists are trying to do, is to cause terror, to make us afraid, to paralyze us so that we cannot function. And so, when terrible things come our way, how will we respond? When evil knocks at the door, how will we respond? When the life that we expected takes a turn the opposite direction and takes us down a road we did not plan to go and don't want to go, how will we respond? When terror threatens to terrorize, how will we respond? When freedoms go away, how will we respond? When hatred comes because of who we stand for, persecution, being reviled, mocked, lied about for Jesus' sake, how will we respond? When men or devils snarl and threaten to kick us in the teeth, how will we respond? Our tendency may be to run, to be timid, to back down from the fight. Maybe it is to be just afraid, be paralyzed by terror, especially in spiritual matters. 
Maybe when there's a physical fight, many of us would be willing to stand toe-to-toe and fight. But when it's a spiritual battle, how do we respond? How will we respond? Because the spiritual battles are all around us constantly. How do we respond? Do we run? Do we duck for cover? Do we hide? Or do we fight? When those spiritual battles come after us every day, or maybe at times when they come like a tidal wave, how will we respond? But friends, let me tell you, we need not be afraid of men or devils. We do not need to be afraid of what they will say or do. We do not have to be timid. We do not have to back down from a challenge. We do not have to be big sissies in the middle of the storms, in the face of conflict, in the face of criticism, and even persecution. We do not have to hide and run from the things that stalk and threaten us. Why? Because God did not give us a spirit of fear. But he gave us power and love and a sound mind to fight these battles. And so this morning, I want to spend a little bit of time with you talking about the war on terror. Fighting our own terrors, the things that threaten and stalk us. How do we fight these things, especially in those spiritual ways? How do we stand firm and stand strong especially when we proclaim the name of Jesus and the world hates us for it. How do we fight that war of fear and terror? And so where I want to take you then is 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, as you're looking for that, hopefully you have your Bible or you have a phone app and you can look that up and you can follow along with me. I'll be in the English Standard Version. If you want a paper Bible, we have some on our bookshelf right there on the side of the sound booth. You're welcome to get up and go get one. But 2 Timothy chapter 1, as you're looking for it, I want you to hear me say this. A healthy church, a healthy Christian is not paralyzed to inaction by fear. For fear is from the devil. Instead, God gives us tools to fight the good fight. God gives us tools to stand up for him. God gives us tools to be bold in our faith to declare Jesus to the world around us. And so, 2 Timothy chapter 1, let's read some of it together here. The first 14 verses or so. Follow along with me. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, as I remember your tears. I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first and your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and now, I'm sure, dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you, Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, and which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And so as we read that, we have to understand, I think, 
to really get the full grasp of what Paul is saying, a little background information would probably be helpful to us. And so as Paul is writing this letter to Timothy, it's sort of um, Paul's last will and testament. It's his final book that he writes, and he has some important things to say. Paul is writing from prison in chains because of his witness for Christ, and the church is struggling right now in ancient history. The church is in crisis. Now, the first 25 years after the Christian Um, After the church had been created, basically, the first 25 years, there was rapid uh, spread of the church all throughout the Roman Empire. There was a little persecution, but for the most part, it was okay. But there became a challenge. Everything began to change with Nero. And so in 64 AD, which is what we talked about last week just a little bit, uh, Nero burns Rome. uh, The fire burns for six days, burns almost all of Rome up, and he blames the Christians for it. And then from that point on, there, it ushered in this wave of dramatic persecution against those who called on the name of the Lord, those who were overtly Christian. And it became very difficult and very challenging, very unpopular to then proclaim Christ in the public square. To be able to live a life out loud for Christ became very damaging and very dangerous to life if you wanted to continue to live the life that you had And so it's not surprising that Paul is writing this because of all the stuff that's going on. Paul is writing this letter because he is condemned to death. And he knows that he doesn't have long to live. And he needs to explain something to Timothy so that Timothy will carry the baton on. So that it will not end here. And so Paul is trying to encourage Timothy in the middle of all of these trials. So that this message from Christ will continue. And it's what we do today, even still. Here we are 2,000 years later. And so we hear this message from Paul. And Paul says, Timothy, Timothy, don't burn out in your faith. This is where 2 Timothy 1 begins. Don't burn out. Don't flame out. Don't give up. Apparently, Timothy is either a little apathetic or probably more likely fearful. He's afraid of the terror of the night to proclaim Christ is dangerous. Your life is on the line at this point when Paul is writing to Timothy. And he's saying, don't burn out on the faith. He says in verse 5, I know that you've had a sincere faith, at least in the past. I know that you have. I know how you've been raised with your grandma and your mom, and you're like my kid in the faith. I know you've had a sincere faith. And in verse 6 he says, keep the fire alive. Fan the flames. Fan the embers. Don't let them die out. And I would expect that that's the message for many of you in the room today. Fan the flame. Don't let it burn out. Even in the middle of trial and the things that terrorize us, the things that freak us out, Paul says to Timothy, fan the embers. Maybe he's saying that to rekindle this flame because Timothy's flame has gone out. There's still hot coals there. But Paul's saying, let's build it again. Let's get this thing moving. Don't burn out. Don't give up. Yes, I know it's hard. Paul says this. It's very clear. I know that it's hard. Persecution, opposition, for living a life for Christ, it's going to happen. It's all around. Proclaiming Jesus is costly, but Paul says, God has tools for you, Timothy. God has tools for you to overcome. You don't have to be freaked out. You don't have to be afraid. God has given you something that you can use in order to fan the flames in order to continue on and to not give up and to not burn out on your faith. And ultimately what Paul is saying is, yes, there's persecution and opposition. Yes, there's terror. Yes, there's things to be afraid of. But who cares? So what? We have something ahead that is so much better than anything we see. 
But I think this is the challenge always for us, is that we look at the world around us and we go, but this is what I can see. This is what I've got. But Paul wants to say to you, but there's so much more ahead. Yes, we're going to have troubles in this life. In fact, Jesus promises in this life, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. I've overcome this. And so part of what Paul is saying is, because of what we know to be true, because of a life forever with God that will far surpass anything good that we've got here, don't burn out while you're here. Keep the fire strong, fan the flames, and here is what Paul ultimately wants for Timothy. Have an uncompromising, unflinching commitment to proclaim Jesus, no matter the cost, no matter what comes at you. Don't be afraid. Don't be terrorized of the opposition or potential persecution. Don't be afraid of your present circumstances because your future is not dependent on what you see. And so Paul says then in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, basically this, and we'll put it up on the screen. But he says, God hasn't given you the spirit of fear. He's given you something else. The fear and the freak out moment that you're experiencing, that's not from God. God has something else in mind for you. And so that is that timidity, that cowardice, that hair that stands up on the back of your neck, the chill up your spine, the race, racing of your heart, the uh, acid that burbles up, the what was that moment, all of those things, the unwillingness to talk about Jesus, that's all fear and that's not from God. The devil is the power source for that. The devil is the one that fuels the fear. The devil is the one that stokes that furnace up to get us freaked out and overwhelmed. The devil is the one who provides the false narratives for us, the stories, the backstories, all the stuff that we see and experience and freak out by. The devil is the one who wants to paralyze us to inaction by fear. Fear, an acrostic for false evidence appearing real. There's all sorts of false evidence around us that makes us believe at any moment in time, life is over. This is the worst thing I've ever seen and experienced. Let me just ask you, by show of hands, anyone in the room ever been to a point in your life where you thought, my circumstances are so bad, I'm not sure I'll live through this? Anybody? And yet, here you are. And so part of what Paul is saying is, the devil's the one that brings that fear now, here's the thing. Both Testaments, both the Old and the New, talk about a healthy fear. There is a healthy fear. There is a good fear. There's a fitting and proper fear of God. But for the believer, for those who have called on the name of Jesus and are striving to follow and are walking in his footsteps, it is not a stand in the corner and urinate yourself kind of fear. The fear here is an awe and a reverence of the God who can speak the heavens and the earth into existence. And standing in his presence, the one who can say, let there be light, and there's light, that is an awesome thing. The one who can, with his words, cut through the darkness and cut through the fear by the sound of his voice, by the love that he offers, and by the way that he thinks and functions. This is what we want. But this fear that we're talking about, when Paul says, this fear is not from God, it's not talking about that. The Greek word there is delia. It is a timid, cowardly, selfish character kind of fear. It is the kind of fear that when things don't go our way, when people poke at us and push our buttons, especially for standing up for Christ, that desire to back down and be timid, that is what Paul is saying. That is not from God. That is not what he has for you. And I think that's true even for all the challenges that we face in our normal day-to-day -day life. The things that freak us out. And there's all kinds of things, and it's probably different for everybody, although my guess is that there are similar things that freak us out, that really rattle our cage. But God says, if you will trust me, you still do not need to be afraid. If you are my kids, you can trust me. We sing songs about it all the time. The question is, in our everyday life, do we really trust him in those moments when things seem out of control and we don't know what we're going to do and we can't see the end? There is no light at the end of the tunnel as far as our eyes will tell us. Can we trust him? And if we can, if we can know that he's got our best interest in mind, it destroys fear. 
It takes that fear away. And so Paul says to Timothy, fan the flame. Fan the flame of your faith and of your courage. Fan that flame and recognize where fear is coming from. That fear is not from God. That fear is from the devil who wants us to be ashamed, who wants us to fail, who wants us to give up and be paralyzed into inaction. And Paul wants us to understand the same thing. That a healthy church, a healthy Christian is not paralyzed to inaction by fear. For fear is from the devil. Instead, God gives us tools to do his will. So the question is, what are the tools? Well, we see it lined out for us right there in verse 7. That God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's given us tools. And what's the first tool? The first tool is power. And so when we begin to look at this verse and we unpack it a little bit, that first tool of power, the Greek word there is dunamis. And we've talked about this before. Dunamis is an important word. It's a great force or energy is how we would define it. But it's where we get the word dynamic or dynamite from. But unlike dynamite, which is a raw, unbridled power, this kind of power that God is talking about, that Paul is writing about, is an effective and productive energy. It does work, that it's power in order to accomplish a task. And God gives us power to... Fight against the fear. Here's the good news, by the way. You do not have to have a naturally powerful disposition in order to be powerful in the way that God understands power. A lot of people would think, yes, but the strong, powerful personalities, they're the ones that can tap into that power of God and proclaim boldly what God has in mind. Yes, that may be true, but here's the deal. You don't have to have that kind of personality in order to have the power of God working through you. And working through your mouth and your actions. You don't have to have this naturally strong personality or charismatic view or personality of your life. You don't have to have that in order to do it. Because it's God who gives us the strength. And God who gives us the character and confidence to face opposition that comes. It is through him that we have the ability to stand up and speak and preach and teach and live the life worthy of the calling we've received. Our theme for the year here at Renew, Ephesians 4.1. He gives us the power to do it. That we can do these things because of his power, not because I'm powerful. Not because you're powerful. None of us are powerful enough to fight the spiritual battles that rage around us in our flesh We need God's power to fight this fight. And so God replaces our timidity, our our timidness, and our cowardice with boldness for him to declare him to the world through our actions, how we deal with our individual circumstances as we stand on his promises and we trust him and we move forward even in the moment of fear for the rest of the world. And we stand strong. They will see that it is God at work. Paul lived out what he says. He knew what he was talking about. Like in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, he says this, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. You see, I would anticipate that Paul was a pretty strong personality. If you know anything about Paul, if you've ever read anything that he said, you would guess that. But he says, it's not because of that that I was able to preach boldly. It was a demonstration of the Spirit's power, of God working through me. And of course, that makes sense. I mean, you look at other places in the Bible, like in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, as the church is beginning to grow, as the church is getting kicked off, basically, at the beginning of the book of Acts, and Jesus' promise is that when the Holy Spirit comes, it will be the power that you need in order to be a witness here, there, and everywhere, to witness for Christ, to stand up for Jesus. It's the power of God that does that. The power of God working through us, the power of God working through our actions, the power of God working through our mouth as we get into a moment and we begin to speak. Let me ask you, have you ever experienced that? Where you were in that moment and you have the right opportunity to proclaim Jesus or tell your story of how God's worked in you or changed you, transformed you, or how you've seen him working 
in your church or something. Have you ever been in that moment and you opened your mouth to speak and it's like something else took over? And the words flowed easily. Words maybe you never planned or things that you never even planned to say, they just begin to flow. This is the power of God that speaks and gives us the confidence and the boldness to proclaim Jesus no matter the circumstances. To proclaim Jesus even in the face of adversity or people that will mock or lie and hate you. He gives us the strength to do it. Here's an example I got a text this week that I thought was fitting and beautiful. Here's the text. I got permission to share it with you. Here's what it says. I don't know if I'm becoming bolder in my faith or if I'm just having a weird day. Let me just stop there. Anyone else identify with that? I don't know if I'm becoming more bold in my faith or if I'm just having a weird day. I, I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I, I have a lot of those days. Like, is this just a weird day? Or is this just God's really working and making himself known? But, um, but she says, I'm becoming, I, I think I'm becoming more bold in my faith. But, and here's why. I just bought food. I told my story and I prayed with a homeless man in Little Rock over breakfast at McDonald's. Blessed to be a blessing. I've always found it easy to talk to and pray with kids Today may, be, today may have been my first experience ever praying out loud with an adult. And I just needed to share this story with someone, and you seemed like a good candidate. Yes. I was a good candidate. Thank you. But it's the power of God that works and begins to give us a boldness to proclaim Christ. Wherever we are, whenever we are. A boldness to say there's a truth here. And I can declare it when God gives me opportunity and pray for opportunity. But that's the power that we're talking about, the power from God to do what we just cannot do on our own, what we can't do in our own power. This must be why, as you, if you, as you look through the entirety of the Bible, that God continues to choose people we would never choose to proclaim the message, fishermen, tax collectors, shepherd boys. Because it's obvious when you see what God does for them that it's the power of God at work, not just their natural inclination to lead. And so God gives us his power to be bold, to fan the flame. God gives us a second tool, and that's love. And that's what it says, again, in 2, Corinthians, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us tools, power, and love. Now that love is an important one and it accompanies power and we need them together and we'll talk about that in a moment. But it's love for listeners, that's believers or unbelievers that we have to have. We have to have that love for them. That love that we get from God is an agape love. It is a chosen love. It is a choice that says I will do the very best for you. I desire to give you the very best, even though you may never return it or you may never be able to repay it in any way. I will give you the very best. This love that we're talking about, this love that Paul is talking about, which is a tool to fan the flame, is not a selfish or sensual love like an eros love can often be. It's not a conditional love or an emotional love like a philo love, but it is that agape love, which is the love that we begin to understand from God, that he chooses us, and he chooses to do the best for us even when we don't understand it and could never repay it. But God's love never ebbs and flows. His love is constant and consistent even if you don't get it, even if you think it's the opposite. If you are a follower, you can know that that is true, that his love for you is constant and continual even in the middle of our craziness. But for us to love, it is that self-denying grace that says to others, I will give myself away on your behalf. And this love that we get from God that we direct back to God. And we love because he first loved us. We begin to understand what love looks like because of his love. And as we accept that love and we give that love back to him, it's from this love that we're able to say, I will give all of me away. I will give all of me away to you out of a love for you. I will give all of me away to anyone else. I will love you with the entirety of my being, whether you are my friend family, neighbor, or even as it says in Luke 6, my enemy. This kind of love 
endures the nastiest of opposition. This kind of love allows us to love and to forgive and not retaliate, to do good even to those who want to do us harm. And it is so easy to mess it up. I'll tell you, in my early days, all I wanted to do was argue. I wanted to just be right. I've made this, uh, um, I don't know, uh, it's, I guess it's not a joke. It is a, I came to reality in my own mind that at 43 years old, I've changed a lot in the last 20 years or so. Hopefully, you can say that you've changed a lot over the years. But um, I remember when I made a commitment to follow Christ, I was an adult, I was about 21. Um, in fact, it was November 27th of 1994 that I looked at Jennifer and said, I know it's getting late, and, uh, but do you think anyone would mind if I went down there and got baptized real quick? Like, I, do you think it's okay? That was how I asked, you know, if she thought I should be baptized. She just, you know, started crying and all blubbery and stuff. And so I went and did that. And then I came back, and my first things out of my mouth were, now I can use my powers for good. That's how I responded. <laughs> now, the idea was, I thought, now I can debate on the other side of the fence. I'll debate on the Jesus side, and I'll blow up all the other heathens that I used to be. I'll just blow them up, because now I've got a new power, and I've got a new way, and I'm going to debate on the right side. Hallelujah. And that's what I did. And so at 23, so the couple of years in, at 23, I just wanted to debate you and win the debate. I didn't care what it did to you. I just wanted to win. I would take any side I could, whatever you said, I'd take the opposite side, just to show you I was right. Anybody identify with that kind of personality? At 23. At 33, it began to change as it began to grow and mature in that faith. And at 33, I wanted to still be right, but I didn't want to blow you up in the process. I was learning how to really love people and say, you can be wrong if you want to, but I will love you anyway. But at 43, I just want peace. That doesn't mean I don't want right. There is a right and wrong. You know that, yes? The only right and wrong is not what Spencer Dunlap thinks, by the way. The only right and wrong is what God has to say. I can only say what he says. I still want him to be right. But at the end of the day, we don't need to debate it, really, because the truth is you either accept that or you don't. And I don't have to blow you up. And you don't have to blow me up. I just want there to be peace, and I want for God's word to be seen as true. That we can transform and change, and it is the power, but it also is the love of God. That as we begin to experience his love and understand that love and give that love back to him and then give it to others because we cannot give that love away to others until we understand it from God, we have to understand that. We have to experience it before we can give it away. I think this is part of what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. This is the new commandment. Now, that doesn't get rid of the first and greatest commandment or the second commandment to love God with all of you, to love your neighbor, but a new command I give you. Jesus one-ups it even more, John 13, 34. Here's a new commandment I give to you, to love one another as I have loved you. Ooh, that is hard. Why? Because it's a sacrificial love. It's an agape love, which means I'm going to do the very best for you even when you do not deserve it. Even when you deserve to be kicked in the teeth, I'm going to give you love. I'm going to give you the very best. I'll be sacrificial to the point of I'll give my life away for you to hear about Jesus. I'll give my life away. For you to know Jesus. I sacrifice my life so you'll know him. I will. And if we can love each other like that, not just me to you, but you to me, and you to each other, if we could actually pull that off, that we'd be willing to lay down our own life so that someone else will follow Jesus. If we could have that kind of love, verse 35 of John 13 says, All the people will know that you're my disciples. They'll all know that you're my kids because it is so countercultural and so opposite from the rest of the world. It sets us apart. Love is a powerful tool. 
And then the third tool that Paul tells Timothy that he has, yes, you have power, God's power. You have love, the love from God, but also a sound mind. That you have the right thinking, a sound mind, self-discipline, self-control. That's what it is. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear. Instead, he's given you tools to fan the flame of faith, the power, the love, and a sound mind, the ability to think. The Greek literally means a secure and sound mind, but it also carries the additional connotation with it of a disciplined and properly prioritized mind. Now, properly prioritized mind is a challenge. This is one of the things we've talked about around here a few times. But most of the time in our lives in the American culture, we juggle a lot of stuff in our lives. We have all kinds of things that we deal with on a daily basis. And a lot of us find Jesus and we just make him one more of the things that we juggle. I've got work and I've got school. I've got the lake. I've got fun. I've got baseball. And oh, this Jesus guy. I'm going to add him in, and I'm going to juggle him now. And then when life gets out of control, because the truth is, you can only juggle so many balls. Am I right? There becomes a time where we've got, to stop, we've got to stop juggling them all and throw a few of them out because we just can't handle anymore. The question is, which one gets dropped first? It's usually Jesus. Church. Encouraging one another. It's easy to give that one up for most of our people in our culture. Because they make Jesus just one more thing, equal to everything. But that's not at all what we're called to. A sound mind, a disciplined mind, a right priority mind that God gives us as a tool says, no, Jesus is not one more thing. He is the thing. And everything else, our pleasure, our joy, our fun, our work, our job, everything is subject to him because he's not just a thing, he is the thing. And in order to fan the flame, we have to have a sound mind because if Jesus is just a thing, you will not have a sound mind and you will chase the wrong things always. Always. Not sometimes. Always. If Jesus is not the thing, It is easy to get sidetracked and easy to get pulled away. But when we live by this godly discipline, our priorities are in place. Our priorities are in the right order. And every aspect of our lives is devoted to advancing the case for Christ. And out of this comes joy and hope and even pleasure. When we're in that sweet spot doing what God's called us to do and becoming the people that he's called us to be. And that's in our personal life, or business life, at home, at church, anywhere. And I will say all of these tools that Paul tells Timothy that he has at his disposal, all of those tools work best when they're in harmony with one another. Because if we have the power of God without love and a sound mind, we will kill people. We'll just run right over them. Do it my way or else from the hammer of God. That's what happens when you have the power without the love and the discipline. You've all experienced that, would be my guess. But when we have love without the power and without the discipline, what happens is people think love is the only thing that's important. Love is important, but you have to have truth. And that we love people so much that we tell them the truth. This is the part our society has forgotten. The idea is that love always wins. Well, guess what? Love does win, but it's love with truth and a sound mind. They go together. That we have to love people so much that we're willing to tell them the truth, even if it's hard and even if it hurts. And then a sound mind. You know what? Here's the deal. If we have a disciplined mind without the power of God and without the love, we become legalists. We just want a checklist. It doesn't matter about how you feel. It doesn't matter if you love. You just do the right things. I've got the checklist. They go together. And what Paul's telling Timothy is to fight the terror, to fight the good fight, to fight against the things that bring fear and trepidation into our lives. Understand that fear is not from the devil. Excuse me, fear is from the devil. That what God gives us instead is a sound mind and love 
and his power. And so why is this so important to us? Well, here's the deal. Don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. Stop allowing the things of life to steal your joy. That's what the devil wants. Fear is not from God. Fear is from the devil. He wants to rob you of your joy in following Christ. Stop being afraid. Don't be afraid of your momentary problems, money things, health things. Trust in the Lord. Surrender it to Him and allow Him to do what He does. And things won't always turn out the way we want them to. Okay. But we know there's a promise. That is, we have glory with God forever. Yes, we'll have troubles in this life, but take heart. God's got this. Quit allowing fear to ruin your life. Quit allowing fear and terror to ruin every day and your sleep and every moment. And certainly, do not be afraid to, afraid to speak the truth in love about who Christ is. Tell the truth. People will hate you for it. So what? We tell the truth in love. Yes, persecution and reviling, mocking and lies will be told. Okay. Fan the flame. And so that's where we go from here. What do we do with this? Well, fan the flame. Fan the embers of your faith. For some of you here today, some of you watching online, there's just a spark. And it's just barely there. Okay, fan that. Fan that thing. Don't let it go out. What is it of faith like a mustard seed? Just a little bit is where it begins. But fan that thing. Fan that flame. If your coals have grown cold, fan the flame. If the distresses of the world and life have gotten you down and beaten you up, and you're thinking, where are you, God, in the middle of this? He's here. Oh, he's here. But he's saying to you, that fear that you have, the distrust that you have, that is not from God. That is from the devil who wants to paralyze you to inaction by fear, fan the flame. God's power, love, sound mind, fan the flame. If the coals are hot, fan the flame. And if the fire is raging, fan the flame and allow that fire to catch fire next to you and allow that fire to grow like a fire in dry stubble and let it spread and spread wherever you go. Fan the flame. Fan the flame. Fan the flame by spending time with God every day. Not just next Sunday. Don't check a box. Fan the flame later today. Go reread 2 Timothy chapter 1. Read it again at home today, twice. Say, what do you want me to see here? Show me. Fan the flame. Tomorrow, read it again. Fan the flame. Pray. No, you don't have to have special words. Here it is. God, here I am, and I don't know what to say. Teach me how to talk to you. And he will. Fan the flame. Choose to love your neighbor. Fan the flame. Choose to seek after righteousness. Fan the flame. Fan the flame together, because... If you've ever had that campfire that's about out, when there's a couple of you, fan the flame. Oh, isn't it better? Fan the flame together. Quit skipping opportunities for us to come together because it's so much harder to keep the flame alive when it's just us by ourselves. Fan the flame. Let me fan it for you. You fan it for me. Let's fan this together. Love one another sacrificially. Fan the flame. And whether you are just a spark or a cold, dying ember, or a hot coal, or a burning, raging fire. Fan the flame. Fan the flame. Quit allowing the devil to steal your joy. The devil is responsible for your fear. Allow God to help you fan the flame with his power and his love 
in his mind, fan the flame. Let's fan the flame. I'm going to give you just a couple minutes to reflect, to pray. Here's what I would pray if I were you. Here's what I will pray when I go sit down. God, help my flame to grow and grow to the point where others will see it. And it will break the darkness around us so that people will see the truth and not be caught up in the lies of the dark. Fan the flame and allow my flame to grow so that others will catch on fire and that their flame will catch the next one on fire and the flame will grow. Fan the flame in me. Help me to want to fan the flame. It starts with your desire. If you don't want this, sit in silence. But if you are ready for God to help you fan the flame, it's time. Fight the good fight. Quit allowing the devil to steal your joy. Quit allowing the terror and the fears of your life to overwhelm you. And let's proclaim Jesus to the world. Fan the flame. So pray. Ask God for that. To ignite something new and bold. And that it will catch around you. Take that moment to do it. We'll come back together and we'll finish up in a moment. This is my revelation, Christ Jesus.